Dr. Vresh, can you tell me how fasting affects the microbiome? Absolutely. So we know that microbiome, um, there's a couple of factors with microbiome that really, really benefit not only biodiversity, but also help with reestablishing healthy kind of populations. And there is so much research on intermittent fasting and healthy microbiome populations and repopulating healthy populations. Um, most of the research actually shows more 14 to 16 hour intermittent fast. What we've actually seen here at True North, because we have been doing a little bit, not in a formal, you know, uh, kind of randomized study, but just in patients that have come in with certain types of digestive issues, uh, metabolic concerns, we've done microbiome assessments and we've seen really great improvements and actually faster resetting of health components because of what they're doing with not only the water fasting component, but remember the biggest aspect of the water fasting is that you're refeeding with whole food plant-based and the high, high fiber foods is vital as well to that biodiversity. So, yeah. Wonderful. And what are some of these um, healings that you've seen happen in the microbiome? Is that evidence through, say, allergies going away? Not directly. We do. I will say this. We do see allergies be improved through uh, fasting. We've seen, obviously, there's a beautiful side effect with fasting with weight loss. Uh, metabolic concerns really start to go into remission, like um, hypertension, um, not only diabetes, people lose weight easier actually after a fast too. So thyroid concerns improve. I will say that while allergies is not something that we can necessarily see on microbiome assessments, we can see disordered patterns, which is called dysbiosis. We can see that improve for sure after people have not only fasted, but then maybe needing some supportive protocols afterwards um, improve much faster than they normally would have. Thank yeah. you. And you're also an expert in women's health. And mm -hmm. I'm personally curious because I've started to see stuff surface about how males and females respond differently to fasting and have different needs. Can you go into that? So what we learned from research is the fact, and, and remember, I, I do just want to say most of the research that's being done right now is really with intermittent fasting. We're hoping at True North that we can kind of shift that a little bit more and do more prolonged. And so prolonged is anywhere after five days, five to 40 days. So um, but with that literature that we understand, um, women, because we menstruate and because we have different hormonal kind of diurnal patterns, the, the way that we fast can actually, or I should say it this way, our hormones can be affected by the way that we fast. And so I've seen endometriosis, fibroids, um, menstrual irregularities all improve when people have gone through fast and there is a timing aspect to it. So um, with prolonged fasting, uh, because we're going into such a deep cleanse and there is such a difference with what kind of hormone regulation there is, um, it's not as imperative, but with females, if we're talking about more like even intermittent fast, like anywhere from even three to five days, doing those in their first half of their month cycle actually shows to be improvement more so than doing it in the luteal phase, which is the last part of the cycle. And that has to do with estrogen and progesterone cycles versus like the males who have like the testosterone type of, of um, balancing, but they definitely do react differently with um, different types of hormones. For instance, fasting can actually improve testosterone levels as well in males. So it's a really great um, kind of buffer for uh, men as well. Mm -hmm. Have you measured that in You've patients? Mm -hmm. Wow. Fasting improves testosterone. I have not heard that before. That's great. Yeah, and I will say this too, just as a little side note, it usually takes a few cycles post-fast in order to notice the differences. So as, as you can imagine, because it's such a cycling aspect, we don't see it right off the bat. But it, when we check back in with patients and we check back in two to three months later, we actually do see different um, changes. So I actually just had a patient that we just double checked their testosterone levels and it did change and it did improve just with fasting. Just with fasting. What do you think is responsible for that? Is it the detoxification that happens? It probably could be detoxification. So that's one aspect. The other thing is too, is that when I always think about hormones, I think about a couple of things. One is, um, does the body have enough cortis, um, uh, cholesterol, right? To be a building block for those different types of hormones. Is those 
different types of um, components of how hormones are made. Does the body have sufficient cofactors? Does the different um, metabolites, are they able to be not only built up, but broken down? And so the liver is a huge component for that too. So not only does it go into detox pathways, but it also talks about how healthy the liver is, you know, and, and whether or not it can be processing those hormones. The other thing too, is that, you know, when you're regulating cholesterol, that can actually be very powerful. Interesting. Yeah. And what are some other more unexpected benefits of fasting that you've seen in patients? Um, some of the, well, there are so many. Oh, my goodness. You just list them all. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to think of all of them. Um, I think I think some of the most amazing ones are not only, so as we know, like side effect of weight loss is a really great one. Um, I think thyroid um, improvement is a really great one, especially when people are able to um I mean, I don't think people come in automatically thinking they can get off their thyroid medication or even see a reduction in their in their thyroid medication. And we do see that um, we see autoimmune antibodies go down, you know, and a lot of people pain reduction across the board. Um, I think one of the greatest things that we see, and I actually just talked to a patient with this people because it's an empowerment, right? We, we have a system right now, a conventional medical system that is amazing in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, especially if you go into the emergency room, you see it all over the place. Um, but what it also does, it takes the power away from the patient, right? It says, it's nothing to do with you. You just take this for the rest of your life. And in, you know, this can't be healed. You know, you're going to have this for forever. Um, what fasting does do is it gives the power back to the human or back to the, to the person and says, no, you actually have a choice. You have a choice on lifestyle. You have a choice on diet. And your body has a brilliant ability to heal. So it brings back hope. When a person has hope. I really do feel that that's where you have these amazing kind of stories of like spontaneous or radical remissions or people who are able to be, you know, autoimmune in remission and, and stay there and they never have any issues afterwards, you know, so there's all that benefit that I think that provides them. And that's across so many different fields, right? And do you often get cases of patients who've tried lots of conventional modalities and feel like there's absolutely no treatment available there for their condition, so they might as well try fasting? Yes. Uh, probably, I want to say, I think probably like 70% of patients are here with that. I would say it's a high number. It's a high number. Percent of them, do you think, see some actual healing happen in that previously chronic condition? It's, it's hard to put a percentage on it, but I would say the majority of people will see some sort of benefit with that. So um, the number of times I have heard somebody say, I've lost hope. I, the doctors have turned me away and said that there is nothing more that they can do. Um, they are on their, whatever it is, seventh, eighth medication for the same exact, you know, um, kind of condition. Um, or, you know, the doctor just says, oh, it's fine you know what, there's nothing we can do about it, right? Like they don't even give another option. I mean, that is that is very, very much uh, a large population of who comes here and sees amazing benefits with just even allowing the body to do the healing, right? And then I always have to say, like, if you follow it with really the dietary and lifestyle components, I mean, it's it's, you know, that's why people always say, you know, once you know what healthy feels like, there's no going back, right? How do you work with patients who continually revisit you because they can't stay compliant? A lot of different ways. So um, one of the questions I always ask my patients is, what is your obstacle to cure? So um, the obstacle to cure question, how it narrows it down is that it really allows me to understand like what is the thing that stands in the way of them reaching their optimal health goals in life. And it also allows them to do the meditative process to understand what that is for themselves. Um, so that can, that can be anywhere from setting up weekly visits with them for accountability. So we're, we're social beings, right? So sometimes when we're held accountable, it's so powerful for the individual. Um, sometimes it's about just figuring out their meal plan. Um, sometimes if people are really, really busy, it's about finding 
um, places that can deliver food for them or having a chef come in to actually cook the meals for them or just even prep the meals for them. Um, sometimes it's about, you know, even the finest tunes, like listening to the patient. Like, for instance, I remember a patient when we teased out why she was not eating, why she was overeating, it was because she sat in front of the TV. So I said to her, get the TV out. And so she she listened, she got her TV, she moved it into the garage. That made the difference because now at the end of the day, she wasn't staring at a TV. So she was saying to herself, should I go for a walk? Should I do something else? So it's behavioral modification and really understanding what it is for the person that needs to change. I feel like as a naturopath, that's part of your specialty. You see the holistic person and you look at all factors that affect their health. You have to. You have to dig in deep. You have to ask about sleep, community, support, obstacles, right? Um, you have to ask about what is it that you want? Like, what, how do you want to feel, you know, in this lifetime? Um, you know, are you moving your body, right? Like, are you, are you getting hydrated? Or, like, tease it apart. Tell me what goes on in your day, right? How do you wake up in the morning? What do you, what's the first thing you do? Because if somebody's watching and looking at their phone first thing in the morning, that's sending off so many different signals and chemicals, right, that are changing the course of their day. So. Thank you. And if you had to pick one especially unexpected patient healing that you you witnessed, what would it be? Oh, my gosh, you're asking all the hard questions. Um, what is the one that I would say would be? I mean, there, there's been so many amazing ones. I would say I'm going to give you a couple just because um, there's a couple that stand out. So one is I remember a gentleman and it, it almost looked like I forget what um, movie it was, but it was he looked like his skin was ripping off his entire body. Um, he had eczema so bad that literally it looked like the the rock from I think it's Superman or whatever where it's like it looked super dry it looked cracked it looked like his you could peel his skin off right um head to toe I remember sweetest guy um he did a 21 day fast the eczema totally resolved so like we we actually did follow-ups with him and it, it was it was almost like night or day that was one of the most I've seen eczema resolve a lot with um water fasting that was one of the most dramatic healings I've ever, ever seen. We had a woman from Europe. This was years and years ago. She was on three or four different meds. Um, this was one of my first patients when I first started. This was like going back almost a decade. And um, she came in with meds. She was like nine out of 10 pain. And by the end of her 30 day fast, she was in no pain, no meds. She went home and she was like, I mean, she was just a whole different person. She had rheumatoid arthritis. So she still obviously had it, but she was brought into remission from the fast. So, um, I mean, there's just, there's story after story of, of situations like that. I mean, you, you, you probably, or your, you know, uh, viewers probably heard of like, we've seen lymphoma really go into remission. Like, I mean, there's just been a lot of amazing healing happening. What conditions do you think haven't responded that well to fasting in your experience? That haven't? What hasn't responded that well to fasting? That's a good question. Most things do. I would, you know, I would say this. I think that many different conditions can respond. There are nuances within different conditions that potentially has to do with either diet, lifestyle, or something that is undiscovered within um, a person's life that will then dictate whether or not how far a fast can take them. Because if I if I had to think about it, I, I really have probably, if you've named like every single condition, I probably have seen a little bit of benefit from every single human um, that has kind of walked through the doors to what degree, whether it's full remission or, you know, a uh, full cure is definitely, you know, variant within it. Um, with speaking out loud about it, I will say sometimes more neurological concerns, I would say probably in my in my time here has responded the least. Um, and what I mean by that is like, they're the rare, rare types of like transverse mellitus or, um, you know, maybe encephalitis we've seen, um, you know, multiple sclerosis usually does respond well, but in some cases doesn't. So, you know, it's it's some of those actually are, are harder, um, I think, to get really deep and underneath. But like I said, there's always variances with every single one of them. What about cases like Alzheimer's and dementia? How do you see fasting affect that? 
we don't, I haven't, since I've been here for almost a decade, we haven't seen a lot of Alzheimer's cases here. We have seen really early dementia type cases. Um, and I will say this, from the, from the literature and what we are finding out about these conditions, there's always something in diet, lifestyle, toxicity, you know, microtoxins, mold, um, it could be microbiome dysregulation, which we're doing so much research into, right? And finding a lot there that are massively connected with foundations of natural hygiene, right? Like, are you getting enough vitamin D, right? Are you eating whole food plant-based polyphenols that is not only detoxifying to the system, but they're providing vitamins, minerals, nutrients, cofactors that, you know, your neurotransmitters needs, your brain function needs, all of that stuff. Um, so, and sleep, right? Are you sleeping seven to nine hours? Are you sleeping through the night? How's your stress level? You know, how are you managing the stress level? Do you have a good community around you? Are you lonely? You know, are you using, you know, toxic substances like alcohol, marijuana, things like that, that we know can destroy the brain cells, you know, or, or destroy gray matter. So when we assess those, there's definitely a huge need for people in a preventative field, right? To do this first and foremost in order to maybe prevent that later on. We have though, in the early cognitive decline type of stages, we have seen people improve for sure here. Um, but again, I haven't personally seen you know, people in more like mid to late stage, unfortunately, just because I don't think that's, it's not the way that we're set up to, you know, kind of safely handle that um, type of condition. I see. So, so gold hammer would screen them out because they're not appropriate patients anyway for True North. True. True. Yeah. You know, the way that we're designed, um, it really would be important for people to have some sort of autom autonomy. Um, and if they don't, they do need a full on 24 hour support. So with like, like an angel service or something to that effect. So it's, it's a little bit more difficult just because of the nature of the fasting clinic, you know, and in some cases, if somebody is having trouble with cognitive decline, if they're on, you know, certain types of medication, fasting might not be the avenue we want to take them. Um, but potentially like whole food, you know, nutritious type of diet, having a community, being in a place that's very supportive, learning health promoting properties would be a place, you know, would be the aspects we would want them to have, right? So, yeah. Absolutely. And on the subject of diet, at True North, we don't use oil in our food, but there's just so many studies that seem to show that oil, like olive oil, is so beneficial for health, it improves the absorption of fat, soluble nutrients. So how do we justify excluding oil from our diets? So what I usually, the way that I always look at patients is in a very individualistic kind of way. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because I, I truly believe while we can really drive people into the most healthiest way to eat for themselves, um, there is going to be variance within individuals. And so what I usually say to individuals is that, you know, if you're having high cholesterol, right, or if you have any sort of cardiovascular disease, if we are seeing diabetes, if we're seeing metabolic kind of conditions, there's enough literature, there's enough clinical evidence as well, where um, doing oils that are really highly concentrated, right, or, or obesity, which actually is the cornerstone for a lot of other metabolic conditions, um, there is enough literature showing that that is something that we can actually exclude from the diet, get really healthy forms of fats, right? From nuts, from seeds, from flax, chia, all this other good stuff. Um, and we don't need that highly concentrated, which also is usually rancid, right? When you get it into stores um, and also can have toxic components that's even more concentrated because it's in oils. Um, the reason I went into the individual piece is that if we have someone that's kind of um, more in a preventative realm and they don't have high, high risk factors, you know, and in the world, they want to use it really sparingly here and there. That That isn't necessarily the thing that's going to make or break them in the long run. Because when we look at longevity studies, because we have to look at everything in the course of, you know, di dictating or, or helping people steer people in the right direction. Um, when you're looking at longevity studies, when you're looking at, you know, epidemiology, 
you will find that people are living to be 90, 100 years old, and they're using oil, but they're using it not in the American sense where they're drenching it, right? They're using a very small amount. They're using it maybe as a either a cooking method or a very small amount in like a, a dressing or something to that effect. And they're using pretty high quality. That's not being sprayed. There's less toxicity as well. So those are the factors that you have to play into um, kind of recommending one approach versus another for each individual. Right. So it sounds like the use of oil may not necessarily be detrimental. However, in places like America, perhaps people are using very low quality oil and too high quantity. It's very hard to moderate. So that can be perhaps attribute to why uh, here we exclude that. Absolutely. Or just even like high heat, right? Like we're so we're even causing more damage, right, to like the different oils and our bodies because of what heat can do to oil. And it sounds like you know, people like Goldhammer talk about being 100% salt oil sugar free. And it sounds like you're more open to patients having more levity in term more room in terms of what they're choosing to include or exclude. Is that correct? I work at True North because there is absolutely a time and a place where doing whole food plant based, no salt, no sugar, no oil is foundational and absolutely necessary for a person to move forward in their healing journey. So um, I know when I first started, there was just an ongoing joke that McDougal, you know, gets this kind of, it's, I always call him, he's the gateway drug, right, into whole food plant-based. Um, so when people come to him, there is a huge population that improves just by going whole food plant-based, right? I mean, that's it. Like there's, you know, they're still having salt. They're still having oil, uh, not oil, but they're still having salt or sugar in their diet. Um, the people that come to True North have some condition that doesn't, isn't responding or they need to go to a deeper, deeper level or they found water fasting and they want to go to that deep level. So in many different populations, especially in the modern day world, because the unfortunate thing is things have shifted, right? So if you would probably be conducting this interview in the 1940s, 1950s, we probably wouldn't even have this conversation because the moderation of salt, sugar, and oil was at a level that we didn't have the issues we're having today. Because of the Industrial Revolution, we have highly, highly processed foods. So what has that has done is it's created the pleasure trap. So it's created this artificial stimulation of dopamine, serotonin, neurotransmitter that Americans are craving. I mean, they're craving these falsified foods because they can't get their fixes, right? And so we're going to sugars. We have more strength than we normally have. We don't have really good ways of kind of dealing with it because we're go, go, go. We're on a do, do, do type of society, right? Which is a part of that whole kind of paradigm. Um, and so there is an absolute need for the no salt, no sugar, no oil, because when we've gone to this one extreme, we have to come back and we have to like regulate the body, regulate the nervous system, regulate the whole physiological system. Once that's completed though, with certain people, there is absolutely variance. I mean, there's, there, 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 there's many patients that I have seen over the years where they have said to me, you know what, Dr. V, if I have a little bit of salt in my food, it actually tastes better. So I'm more inclined to stay with the diet, right? Or, you know what? I find that if I am way too on the strict side of no salt, no sugar, no oil, what happens is I get so consumed that then I start spiral downwards and then I like lose all focus. Whereas if I'm able to kind of moderate and, 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 and do a little bit, but not a lot, I'm able to stay more even. -kill. Those are the people where if they really don't have a major health concern, like let's say high blood pressure or um, autoimmune or cholesterol issues, and they want to say, I'm going to bring in a little bit of salt here, or I'm going to do this a little bit, but I'm able to stay as close to the diet and I feel good and I feel healthy, then there, there is that variance that you can offer you know, certain individuals. And, and that is on a very, very person-to-person -person basis. Yeah. And on the subject of cholesterol, do some people just have hyperlipidemia just out of genetics? Because I know people who they've excluded the oil and they still have high cholesterol numbers. Is that something to be concerned about? There is absolutely a genetic undertow that is present. And, but what I will say is this. 
the genes, and I love this this way of looking at it because I have seen that in practice, is that you know, it's kind of like your genes are the guns, right? That you've heard this. And then basically your the environment, the diet is basically the, the gun going off or the shooting, right? Um, and the reason we use that analogy is because of the fact that genes are there, but there is absolutely epigenetic kind of factors that can modify how they're turned up or how they're turned down. Many times, even in a familiar type of component with hyperlipidemia, meaning they have a genetic undertow, they have a family history of it. If you construct a proper program for them and you find out what is the thing that they need to modify, for instance, a lot of people don't know, but in coffee, there's diterpenes. So if you have high cholesterol, you probably shouldn't be drinking coffee, maybe for many reasons, but for one reason, it can actually elevate cholesterol, right? Um, if their liver is highly toxic, and if the whole toxic container is high, you can have actually higher levels of cholesterol. If people have non-heavy metal toxins, if they have microtoxins, their cholesterol can be elevated even if they're not having any sort of um, highly concentrated fat sources. So these are individuals that might be like, what's going on? My diet is perfect. Why can't I get this down? And that's about being an investigator and kind of figuring out what other pieces maybe need to be kind of checked. Interesting. That, that makes me think about how, for example, poor sleep quality leads to poor metabolism, leads to higher cholesterol. And that can also be perhaps implicated. For sure. Yeah. And even like with diabetes type two, like you brought up poor sleep quality, they've done studies where less than six hours of sleep, just that alone already affects insulin receptors. So you actually decrease insulin sensitivity in not only in the fat cell, but in every cell in the body just by less sleep. So that independent factor will affect it, right? So the person could be eating perfectly just by not sleeping though, that's already changing that one factor. Right. And it sounds like somebody who has already achieved what may be dietary perfection and is still struggling with some of these issues, perhaps through a fast, they can allow the body to detoxify and then maybe they'll see the resolution of, say, the hyperlipidemia or the diabetes. Yeah. I worked with one patient, um, which actually goes by what you just said. She, she did three pretty long fasts, like in the teens, and she saw pretty amazing um, resolution and brought her cholesterol down when doctors said that it couldn't come down. So she, the doctors kept pushing, like, they're like, you should go on statins. And she really did not want to be on statins because she tried them. She didn't have a good response. And so she was just like, what, what else can I do? So this is what we did. We found, fine tuned her diet. She came back three times to do a fast. She was doing the diet and she got there. I mean, she actually had, you know, resolution to it. We had a guy from, um, the physicians committee, for responsible medicine, so Bernard's group, um, he was a he he was he was this fabulous uh, human, and I remember you know we were talking and we, and he was just like I I've been trying so hard to get our cholesterol down, and we we the one thing was the coffee piece right like so eating perfectly perfectly, but the coffee piece is the thing that brought it finally down, and there was a familiar hyper you know lipidemia with both of those kind of cases, so just awesome. Like he was just, I mean, he was thrilled, right? So, I mean, like he was following this whole program, you know, that was laid out for him, but that was the little piece that needed to go. Well, is there anything I didn't cover that you wanted to share with the audience? I think you did a great job. Yeah, no, I think <laughs> you went into the nitty gritty with some really tough questions. So, yeah. Thank you. Excellent as always, Dr. Brush. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.